everyone, and welcome to another episode of Stories for Little People. My name is Christine. We're here at the East Side Freedom Library. I just want to let you know real quick that the stories we're going to read today are for children who are like maybe six and older. But if you're younger, that's totally okay. You're more than welcome to stick along and hear the stories for today. I hope you're enjoying the sunshine out there now that spring is here. So exciting. All right, we'll get started with our books. The first one is called The People Shall Continue. All right, y'all are ready for this? Let's go. Many, many years ago, all things came to be. The stars, rocks, planets, river, animals, mountains, sun, moon, birds, and all things. And the people were born. Some say from the ocean, some say from a hollow log, some say from an opening in the ground, some say from the mountains. And the people came to live in the northern mountains and on the plains, in the western hills and on the seacoast, in the so southern deserts and in the canyons, in the eastern woodlands and in the pedamounts. Some people fished, others were hunters. Some people farmed, others were artisans. Their leaders were those who served the people. Their hunters were those who provided for the people. Their warriors were those who protected the people. Their teachers and their elders of the people all taught this important knowledge. The earth is a source of all life. She gives birth. Her children continue the life on earth. The people must be responsible to her. This is the way that all life continues. The people of many nations visited each other's lands. The people from the north brought elk meat. The people from the west gave them fish. The people from the south brought corn. The people from the east gave them hides. When they, and when there were arguments, their leaders would say, let us respect each other. You will bring, we will bring you corn and baskets. You will bring us meat and flint knives. That way we will live a peaceful life. We must respect each other and the animals, the plants, the lands, and the universe. We have much to learn from all the nations. Nevertheless, life was always hard. At times, corn did not grow and there was famine. At times, winters were cold and they were, there was hardship. At times, the winds blew hot and rivers dried. At times, the people grew uneasy amongst themselves. They, the learned men and women talked with each other about what to do for their people, but it was always hard. They had to have great patience. And they told their people, we should not ever take anything for granted. In order for our life to continue, we must struggle very hard for it. But one day, something unusual began to happen. Maybe there was a small change in the wind Maybe there was a shift in the stars. Maybe it was a dream that someone dreamed. Maybe it was a strange behavior of an animal. The people thought and remembered. A long time ago, there were men who came upon the ocean to the western coast. The people thought and remembered. A long time ago, there were red-haired men who came upon the ocean to the eastern coast. But these were visitors that had not stayed for long. They met with some of the people and soon they left upon the ocean for their homes. Looks like a Viking up here. But now the people began to hear fearful stories. Strange men had arrived on the shores of the south. Spanish, these men call themselves. They came seeking treasures and slaves. These men caused destruction among the people. 
the nations of the south were burned by heedless and forceful men. We call them conquistadores in Spanish. Soon, there were other dreadful stories. More men, these with their wives and children, arrived on the eastern coast. English, French, Dutch, they called themselves. They spoke with a fever that frightened the people who met with them. They taught about God whom all should obey. They said they were special men of this God. Soon, the people saw the destruction of their nations. They soon found out it was the aim of the English, French, and Dutch to take their lands. The rich and the powerful of these men formed an American government. They wanted the land because it was fertile with forests and farmland and wealthy with precious minerals. And they wanted the people to serve them as slaves. When the people saw these men did not respect them and the land, they said, we must fight to protect ourselves and the land. In the West, Pope called warriors from the Pueblo and Apache nations. In the East, Tecumseh gathered the Shawnee and the nations of the Great Lakes and Appalachians and the Ohio Valley to fight for their people. In the Midwest, Black Hawk fought to save the Souk and the Fox Nation. In the Great Plains, Crazy Horse led the Sioux in the struggle to keep their land. Osceola in the Southeast, Geronimo in the Southwest, Chief jo Joseph in the Northwest, Sitting Bull, Captain Jack, all were warriors. They were warriors who resisted and fought to keep the American colonial power from taking their land. From the 1500s to the late years in the 1800s, the people fought for their lives and lands. In battle after battle, they fought until they grew weak. Their, their food supplies were gone. Their warriors were killed or imprisoned. And then the people began to settle for agreements with the American government. The leaders of the people agreed to treaties the people said that they would stop their armed fight. The Americans promised the people they could live on their land. They both agreed was the people's land. Upon this land, the people could hunt and fish and have their sacred ceremonies. Upon this land, the nations of the people could live. The people thought the earth is the source of all life. They knew they must have the courage to continue. The people promised, promised to honor the treaties. The people had agreed to live on reservations. Much of the reservation land was very poor. There was no more buffalo to hunt and the deer and the elk were scarce. Many of the people ran away and they were forced back by the Americans. The nations of the people were weakened and they were broken in united strength. Soon more Americans came. They were gold miners, railroad men, outlaws, missionaries, ranchers. They wanted the rest of the land the people had. Treaters, treaties were broken by them and the reservations grew even smaller. The Americans sent government agents. They told the people they could not live the way they had before. The missionaries asked the government to put a stop to the sacred ceremonies, the dances, the songs of the people. The government agents gathered the children. They took the ch children to boarding schools far from their homes and families. The children from the west were taken to the east. The children from the east were taken to the west. The people's children were scattered like leaves torn from a tree. At schools far from home, the children were taught to become Americans. They learned to be ashamed of their people. The people went to schools. They went to Christian churches. They served in the American army. Some even almost became Americans, but they were still the people. 
They farmed and raised livestock. They made and sold crafts for a living. Nevertheless, the people were very poor. There were no jobs on the reservation. Even though they didn't want to, many of the people had to leave. They were moved by the government into the cities across America, Oakland, Cleveland, Chicago, Dallas, Denver, Phoenix, Los Angeles. They worked in factories, on railroads, in businesses, even for the government. Often, they were discouraged, and their families suffered in the cities. They struggled hard for their lives. All this time, the people remembered. Parents told their children, you are Shawnee, you are Lakota, you are Pima, you are Acoma, you are Tinglet, you are Mohawk. You are all these nations of the people, the people told each other. This is the life of our people. These are the stories and these are the songs. This is our heritage. And the children listened. This has been the struggle of our people. We have suffered, but we have endured, the parents said. Listen, they said as they sang the songs. Listen, they said as they told the stories. Listen, they said. This is the way our people live. All across America, the nations of the people were talking. The Shawnees in the cities of the Navajos in the country, the Seminoles in the Los Angeles, and the Cherokees in, the Oklahoma, in Oklahoma, the Chippewa in Red Lake, and the Sioux in Denver. Everywhere, the people on reservations in small towns and in large cities, they were talking and they were listening. They were listening to the words of the elder people who were speaking. This is the life that includes you. This is the land that it is you. All these things that were pushed away from us and broken by the American powers and government, they are alive and we must keep them alive. All these things will help us continue. Once again, the people realized what was happening to the land. They realized that it was the powerful forces of the rich and the government that made the people suffer. The people looked around them. They saw black people, Latino people, Asian people, many white people and others who were kept poor by American wealth and power. The people saw that these people were not rich and powerful, who were not rich and powerful, shared a common life with them. The people realized they must share their history with them. We shall tell you all our struggles, they said. We are the people of this land. We were created out of the forces of earth and sky, the stars and water. We must make sure that the balance of the earth be kept. There is no other way. We must struggle for our lives. We must take great care with, with each other. We must share our concern with each other. Nothing is separate from us. We are all one body of the people. We must struggle to share our human lives with each other. We must fight against those forces which will make our humanity, who will take our humanity from us. We must ensure that life continues. We must be responsible to that life with that humanity and that strength, which comes from our shared responsibility for this life. The people shall continue. And that was, the people shall continue. All right. The next book is called Suki and the Mermaid. Now, this is a really beautiful book. I want you to pay really close attention to the pictures. You'll see a lot of cool drawings in them. All right, storytellers say, this happened once upon a time on a little island off the coast of South Carolina. A girl named Suki lived with her ma and stepot in a cabin with a sagging porch and a roof so rickety it let the sun shine or rain depending on the weather. Every morning at day clean, Suki would get up and sling her hoe at the weeds in the vegetable garden. If she stopped to fan herself, 
With her wide straw hat, her stepa would shout, Suki, don't you be a skylarking. The girl's mother called, to her, called her new husband, Mr. Jones, but Suki had her own name for her bossy do-nothing man. As her hope rose and fell, she sang, Mr. Hard Times, since you come, my ma don't like me, my work never done. Mr. Hard Times, won't, won't do a lick. Just say, work faster or whip you with a stick. One hot afternoon, when her step pa wasn't looking, Suki threw down her hoe and took off. She ran through the woods of pine and plumetto and mossy oak, past dunes fringed with broom grass, to the breach of shining white sand that was her secret hideaway. She sat down, pulled off her hat, unwound the white handkerchief from her from around her head. The sea breeze cooled her burning face while she wriggled her bare feet deep to where the sand was wet and cold. She sang a little song she had heard somewhere. Thee, thee, down below, come to me, Mama Jo. Suddenly, a beautiful brown-skinned black-eyed mermaid rose up from the water. Hair as green as seaweed hung down to the mermaid's waist. Sunlight sparked off gold combs in her hair and the green scales of her fishtail. The girl was mighty frightened, but the mermaid said pleasantly, How do you do, my lady? You look so hot there in the sun. Come into the water and cool off. Can you imagine a mermaid? <sighs> now Suki had heard folks warn. The merman caught, caught you and pull you beneath the water. She, she, so she said, no, Mrs. I can't swim. I'll teach you to swim if you wish, the mermaid said. Then she added gently, you have no reason to fear me, my lady. I came because our, your song called me. But Suki would only wade along the water's edge while the mermaid drove, dove under the waves and rose and dove again. Each time she brought Suki something, a curious shell or a red and white coral or bits of green and blue grass polished like jewels by the sea. When the sun began to set, Suki cried, Oh, I'm going to be whipped for sure. I clean forgot to feed the chickens and draw water from the river. Give this to your folks, said the mermaid, pressing gold coin onto Suki's hand, and they won't scold you, but you must promise not to tell them about me. When you want to see me again, just come here and sing, Thee, thee, down below, come to me, Mama Jo. Then Mama Jo disappeared beneath the waves. Suki hurried home. At first her ma and stepa yelled because, they had, they, because she had not done her chores. But when she gave them the mermaid's coin, they stared in wonder. Where do you get this? her ma asked. On the edge of the water, said Suki. Well, said her stepa, go off tomorrow to the water's edge and see if you can find some more of these. I will, Suki answered, happy to have more time to spend with the mermaid. After this, Suki went down to the shore every morning when the day was clean. The mermaid taught her to swim, and sometimes they dove through the water together. One day, the two sat talking beside the waves. Soon, I'm going to leave this island and go over to the main, said Suki. I'll live there in a fine place like Bearford or Charleston. My home is down below the sea, away from the world of men, said Mama Jo. You can come with me if you want. I don't think so, said Suki. Before she dove under the, wa under the waves at first dark, the mermaid would give Suki one small gold coin. This the girl gave to her folks, so her ma could buy meat and rice and flannel. But Mr. Jones spent all on Malafi whiskey that came from boat from by a boat from the mainland. So things were not much better in the tumble down cabin. Mm -mm -mm. Suki's mom grew more and more curious to know where her daughter found the gold coins. One morning, she followed Suki to the shore, hiding in the broom grass and the sand dune. She heard Suki sing, 
Thee, thee, down below, come to me, Mama Jo. The woman watched in amazement as the girl and the mermaid swam in the ocean, and she saw the mermaid give Suki one gold coin at the day's end. That night, while Suki slept, her ma whispered to Mr. Jones about what she had seen. If I catch that merman, her husband said, I'll sell her on the main for a pile of gold. What a mean man. Before day clean, as Suki was sleeping, her ma and stepa carried their canoe down to the shore. There the woman sang, Thee, thee, down below, come to me, Mama Jo. When the mermaid rose up from the water, Mr. Jones chased her into the canoe. He flung his net at her, but he, the, the angry mermaid dove beneath the water. She did not come up again, though Suki's ma sang the magic song over and over. At last, husband and wife gave up and went home, each blaming the other for what had happened. They said nothing to Suki, who went to the shore as usual. But Mama Jo did not answer the girl's song that day or any day. Suki grieved her lost friend because there was no more gold. Mr. Jones made her hoe the garden, clean the house, and haul water until the took sick until she took sick. Soon she grew so weak that she could barely get out of bed. But in a dream, the mermaid visited her and said, I will come to you once more and take you to live with me beneath the sea. If you want this, go to the shore and sing. Go to the shore and sing. Thee, thee, down below. Take me down, Mama Jo. Do you think she did it? Do you think she went to the shore? Though she was very tired and sickly, Suki crept down to the shore while her mom and stepa were away. There she sang softly. Thee, thee, down below, take me down, Mama Jo. To her joy, the mermaid rose up. She wrapped strands of her magical hair around Suki so the girl could travel safely beneath the waves. Then they plunged into the ocean. The mermaid carried Suki down, down through the waters to her home in the sea wall. Suki found herself in a vast dry cave. All around her, mother of pearl glowed and filled the place with soft, warm light. Mama Jo said, this is your home now. I will never scold you down here. Suki's living with a mermaid now. For a while, Suki was happy. The mermaid taught her to sing songs and gave her strands of pearls and showed her a rusty chest filled with gold and jewels from a sunken pirate ship. In return, Suki would am amuse her friend with riddles she had learned. But after some length of time, the girl began to pine for the sound of human voices and the mockingbird's sweet song at day clean, for the scent of wild magnolias and jasmine, for the sky of delicious blue and dotted with white clouds and golds. She pleaded with Mama Jo, do carry me back home, missus. At first, the mermaid said no, but touched by Suki's tears, she said, very well. If you ask me a riddle I can't ask, answer, I will take you home. So Suki thought and thought. Finally, she said, there's something that walk all day when, and when night come, she go under the bed and rest. What's that? Mama Jo thought and thought, but she could not solve the riddle. That's a shoe, Suki cried. She had picked the riddle because the mermaid had no feet, and Suki was always barefoot. Suki's very smart. I will carry you to, back to land, said Mama Jo with a sigh. But this time, but time has passed in the world above while you have been with me. You are a grown woman now. 
go to the pirate's chest and take a bag full of coins and jewels. This will be your dowry. When you return, many men will court you, but you will only marry a man named Dembo. If you choose another husband, your treasure will disappear. Then the mermaid wrapped her mossy hair around Suki and brought her to shore. The young woman returned to her rickety cabin where she found her ma and stepa. Suki's ma had grown old, grieving for her lost daughter. She embraced Suki with tears of joy. Mr. Jones had just grown meaner until he seemed only dry bones and bitterness. Seeing Suki's treasure, he pretended to welcome her home. He hid his face in his hands as though he was crying too, but he couldn't squeeze one salt tear from his eye. Of course he can't, he's mean. When the story got around that a young woman had brought a rich dowry, all the young men came counting, courting her. But Suki remembered the mermaid's warning and refused them all. Then, one day, a hard-working fisherman rode across the mainland to court her. Name is Dembo, he said simply. Suki studied his eyes and saw love and honesty and kindness in them. Though he was not as tall or as handsome as her other suitors, she was happy with the man the mermaid had chosen for her. Suki's ma and her neighbors planted a fine, planned a fine wedding, but Mr. Jones had other plans. I've got to get that gold, he promised himself. That night before the wedding, while Suki and her ma were away, the wicked man stuck Dem struck Dembo dead and stole the treasure. No one saw him do the deed, so he hid the bag under his mattress. When Suki discovered the crime, her grief was beyond measure. She ran to seashore, and when she cried, Thee, thee, down below, come to me, Mama Jo. The mermaid appeared, and Suki told her un her unhappy tale. Then Mama Jo said, This is the last time I will come to you. My lady, you must now choose forever between my world and the world of men. Think carefully. Below the sea is a gentle place without time or pain. Up here, hurt and hunger are never far away, and this time is always ready to steal what little you have. But Suki said, I must have Dembo. Do bring my sweetheart back to me, and I won't bother you after this. Mama Jo dropped a seed pearl into the young woman's palm. Set this on Dembo's lips, she told Suki. Then, with a sad goodbye, goodbye, my lady, she vanished beneath the waves. Suki raced back to her cabin where Dembo rested in plain pine coffin. While her mom and the other mourners looked on, she put the tiny pearl on Dembo's closed lips. Right away, life came back to him again. Sitting up, he pointed to Mr. Jones and cried, That's the one who hit me! But the wicked man had snatched the treasure bag and fled to the shore, pursued by Suki, Dembo, and the others. Mr. Jones jumped into his canoe and paddled away, but as everyone watched, a single dark cloud formed above the boat. Lightning flashed and thunder roared. The ocean beneath the cloud began to churn. The high waves swamped the canoe. In a moment, the angry water swallowed the boat and its passenger. Suddenly, the sky cleared and the sea calmed. Though they were sorry to have lost the mermaid's treasure, Suki and Dembo were happy to have each other. They comforted Suki's ma, who said, Mr. Jones wasn't much, but he was all I had in this world. You got us, ma said Suki, giving her a hug. We'll all be getting along just fine now. Yeah, who needs Mr. Jones? The next day, the wedding went ahead as planned. Afterward, Suki took Dembo's hand and led him down to the shore. As the two sat on the beach, Suki 
wriggled her toes deep in the white sand and felt something hidden there. Together, they dug up the lost treasure bag. At that moment, Suki saw the flash of sunlight on green scales and gold combs far out to sea. She blew a kiss across the waves and heard sweet laughter in return. Storytellers say, I step on a thing and the thing bend, and that's the way my story ends. And that's the way we're ending stories for little people this time. Hope you enjoyed the Suki and the Mermaid. It's one of my favorite books. Thank you so much for joining us and I hope to see you next time. Enjoy the sun out there. Bye.